Act Two of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One A Room in Polonius's House. Enter Polonius and Reynaldo. Give him this money and these notes, Reynaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvellous wisely, good Reynaldo, before you visit him to make inquire of his behaviour. My lord, I did intend it. Mary, well said, very well said. Look you, sir, inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, and how, and who, what means, and where they keep, what company, at what expense, and finding by this encompassment and drift of question that they do know, my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it. Take you, as twere, some distant knowledge of him, as thus, I know his father and his friends, and in part him. Do you mark this, Reynaldo? Aye, very well, my lord. And in part him but you must say not well but if it be he i mean he's very wild addicted uh, so and so and there put on him what forgeries you please marry none so rank as may dishonour him take heed of that but uh, sir such wanton wild unusual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty as gaming, my lord. Ay, or drinking, uh, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, drabbing, you may go so far. My lord, that would dishonour him. Faith, no, as you may season it in the charge, you must not put another scandal on him that he is open to incontinency. That's not my meaning but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty the flash and outbreak of a fiery mind a savageness in the unreclaimed blood of general assault but my good lord wherefore should you do this i my lord i would know that marry sir here's my drift and I believe it is a fetch of wit, you laying these slight sallies on my son, as twere a thing little soiled in the working. Mark you, your party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the predominant crimes the youth you breathe of guilty. Be assured, he closes with you in this consequence. Good, sir, or so, or friend or gentleman according to the phrase or the addition of man and country very good my lord and then sir does he this he does uh, what was i about to say by the mass i was about to say something where did i leave at close is in the consequence a friend or so and gentleman at closes in the consequence ay marry he closes thus i know the gentleman i saw him yesterday or t'other day or then or then with such or such and as you say there was a gaming there overtook in rouse there folly out at tennis or perchance i saw him enter such a house of sale videlicet a brothel or so forth see you now your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth and thus do we of wisdom and of reach with windlasses and assays of bias by indirections find directions out so by my former lecture and advice shall you my son you have me have you not my lord i have god be with you fare you well good my lord observe his inclination in yourself i shall my lord and let him ply his music well my lord farewell exit reynaldo 
Enter Ophelia. How oh, now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Oh, my lord, my lord, I have been so affrighted. With what, in the name of God? My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered, and down gyved to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous in purport, as if he had been loosed out of hell, to speak of horrors. He comes before me. Mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last, a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound, as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and in his being. That done, he lets me go, and, with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their helps, and, to the last, bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property fordoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings, as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. I am sorry. What? Have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord, but, as you did command, I did repel his fetters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle, and meant to wreck thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which, being kept close, might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and attendants. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So call it. Sith nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both that being of so young days brought up with him, and sith so neighboured to his youth and haviour, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather, so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you. And sure I am two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and good will as to expend your time with us a while, for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. But we both obey, and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz, and I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. Exeunt Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, 
and some attendants. Enter Polonius. The ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? I assure my good liege I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious King, and I do think, or else this breed of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself do grace to them, and bring them in. Exit Polonius. He tells me, my dear Gertrude, he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main, his father's death, and ah, or hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. Re-enter Polonius with Voltimond and Cornelius. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltimond, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation gainst the Polak. But, better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness, whereas grieved that so his sickness, age, and impotence was falsely borne in hand, sends out arrests on Fortinbras, which he, in brief, obeys. Receives rebuke from Norway, and in fine makes vow before his uncle never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty. Whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him three thousand crowns in annual fee, and his commission to employ those soldiers, so levied as before, against the Polak, with an entreaty herein further shown. Giving a paper that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise, on such regard of safety and allowance as therein are set down. It likes us well, and at our more considered time will read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime we thank you for your well-took labour. Go to your rest. At night we'll feast together. Most welcome home. Exeunt Voltimand and Cornelius. This business is well ended. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste a night day and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and heedlessness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad mad call i it for to define true madness what is but to be nothing else but mad but let that go more matter with less art madam i swear i use no art at all that he is mad tis true tis true tis pity and pity tis tis true a foolish figure but farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad let us grant him, then. And now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect, for this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus. Perpend. I have a daughter have while she is mine who in her duty and obedience mark hath given me this now gather and surmise reads to the celestial and my soul's idol the most beautified ophelia that's an ill phrase a vile phrase beautified is a vile phrase but you shall hear thus reads in her excellent wide bosom these uh, etc came this from hamlet to her good madam uh, stay a while i will be faithful reads doubt thou the stars are fire 
doubt that the sun doth move doubt truth to be a liar but never doubt i love oh dear ophelia i am ill at these numbers i have not art to reckon my groans but that i love thee best oh most best believe it adieu thine evermore most dear lady whilst this machine is to him hamlet this in obedience hath my daughter shown me and more above hath his solicitings as they fell out by time by means and place all given to mine ear but how hath she received his love what do you think of me as of a man faithful and honourable i would fain prove so but what might you think when i had seen this hot love on the wing as i perceived it i must tell you that before my daughter told me what might you or my dear majesty your queen here think if i had played the desk or table-book or given my heart a winking a mute and dumb or looked upon this love with idle sight what might you think no i went round to work and my young mistress thus i did bespeak lord hamlet is a prince out of thy star this must not be and then i precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort admit no messengers receive no tokens which done she took the fruits of my advice and he repulsed a short tale to make fell into a sadness then into a fast thence to a watch thence into a weakness thence to a lightness and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves and all we mourn for do you think tis this it may be very likely had there been uh, such a time i'd fain know that that i have positively said tis so when it proved otherwise not that i know pointing to his head and shoulder take this from this if this be otherwise if circumstances lead me i will find where truth is hid though it were hid indeed within the centre how may we try it further you know sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby so he does indeed at such a time i'll loose my daughter to him be you and i behind an arras then mark the encounter if he love her not and be not from his reason fallen thereon let me be no assistant for estate but keep a farm and carters we will try it but look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading away i do beseech you both away i'll board him presently exeunt king claudius queen gertrude and attendants enter hamlet reading oh give me leave how does my good lord hamlet well god a mercy do you know me my lord excellent well you are a fishmonger uh, not i my lord then i would you were so honest a man honest my lord ay sir to be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand that's very true my lord for if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog being a good kissing carrion have you a daughter i have my lord let her not walk in the sun conception is a blessing but not as your daughter may conceive friend look to it aside how see you by that still harpy on my daughter yet he knew me not at first he said i was a fishmonger he is far gone far gone and truly in my youth i suffered much extremity for love very near this i'll speak to him again what do you read my lord words 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 what is the matter my lord between who i mean the matter that you read my lord 
Slanders, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum-tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak hams. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down, for yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward." Aside, though this be madness, yet there is method in. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed, that is out of the air. Aside, how pregnant sometimes his replies are! A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him, and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You go to seek the Lord Hamlet? There he is. God save you, sir. Exit Polonius. My honoured lord. My most dear lord. My excellent good friends, how dost thou, Guildenstern? Ah, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do ye both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy, and that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap we are not the very button nor the soles of her shoes. Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist, or in the middle of her favours? Faith, her privates we. In the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What's the news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord. Denmark's a prison. <laughs> then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams, indeed, are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. Truly. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies, and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggar's shadows. Shall we to the court, for by my fay I cannot reason? We'll, we'll wait, wait upon, upon you, my lord. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. For to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come. Nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. You were sent for. And there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. <laughs> to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposer could charge you withal, be even and direct with me whether you were sent for or no. Aside to Guildenstern. What say you? Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. 
so shall my anticipation prevent your discovery, and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals! And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh, then, when I said man delights not me? To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what lent and entertainment the players shall receive from you. We cotted them on the way, and hither they are coming to offer you service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh gratis. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickled o' the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. What players are they? Even those you are wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances it they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? Nay, their endeavour keeps in the wanted place. But there is, sir, an airy of children, little Iases, that cry out on the top of question, and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, and so berattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose-quills, and dare scarce come thither. What? Are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escotted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards, if they should grow themselves to common players, as it is most like, if their means are no better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Faith, there has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them to controversy. <laughs> there was, for a while, no money bid for argument unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. Is it possible? Oh, there has been much throwing about of brains. Do the boys carry it away? Ay, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. It is not very strange. For mine uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mows at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, fifty, a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. Splud, there is something in this more than natural if philosophy could find it out. Flourish of trumpets within. There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands, come then. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which, I tell you, must show fairly outward, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a hand-saw. Enter Polonius. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you two, at each ear a hearer. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. Happily he's the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the players, mark it. Uh, you say right, sir, a uh, Monday morning, twas so indeed. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome, 
The actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon mine honour. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical historical pastoral, scene individable, or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the law of writ and liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou! What a treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter and no more, the which he loved passing well. Still on my daughter. Am I not i the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot God wot, and then, you know, it came to pass, as most like it was, the first row of the pious chanson will show you more, for look where my abridgment comes. Enter four or five players. You are welcome, masters, welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend, thy face is valenced since I saw thee last. Comest thou to beard me in Denmark? What? My young lady and mistress? By your lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a chopping. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are all welcome. We'll e'en to it like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted. Or if it was not above once, for the play, I remember, pleased not the million. Twas caviar to the general, but it was, as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved. Twas Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout of it especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Let me see, let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus like the Hyrcanian beast— it is not so. It begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble, when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Head to foot now is he total ghouls, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets, that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their lord's murder, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus o'ersized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire Priam, seeks. So, uh, proceed you. For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Anon he finds him, Striking too short at Greeks, his antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow, with flaming top, stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus ear, for lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But as we often see against some storm a silence in the heavens, the rack stand still, 
the bold winds speechless and the orb below as hush as death anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region so after pyrrhus pause aroused vengeance sets him new a work and never did the cyclops hammers fall on mars's armor forged for proof return with less remorse than pyrrhus bleeding sword now falls on priam out out thou strumpet fortune all you gods in general synod take away her power break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven as low as to the fiends this is too long it shall to the barbers with your beard prithee say on he's for a jig or a tail of baudry or he sleeps say on come to hecuba but who oh who had seen the mobled queen the mobled queen that's good mobled queen is good run barefoot up and down threatening the flames with bison room a clout upon that head where late the diadem stood and for a robe about her lank and all o'er timid loins a blanket in the alarm of fear caught up who this had seen with tongue in venom steeped gainst fortune's state would treason have pronounced but if the gods themselves did see her then when she saw pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs the instant burst of clamour that she made unless things mortal move them not at all would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods look whether he has not turned his colour and has tears in his eyes pray you no more tis well i'll have thee speak out the rest soon good my lord will you see the players well bestowed do you hear let them be well used for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time after your death you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live my lord i will use them according to their desert god's bodykins man much better use every man after his desert and who should scape whipping use them after your own honour and dignity the less they deserve the more merit is in your bounty take them in come sirs follow him friends we'll hear a play to-morrow exit polonius with all the players but the first dost thou hear me old friend can you play the murder of gonzago ay my lord we'll hat to-morrow night you could for a need study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines which i would set down and insert in could you not ay my lord very well follow that lord and look you mock him not exit first player my good friends i'll leave you till night you are welcome to elsinore good my lord ay so god be with ye exeunt rosencrantz and guildenstern now i am alone what a rogue and peasant slave am i is it not monstrous that this player here but in a fiction in a dream of passion could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand tears in his eyes distraction in his aspect a broken voice and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit and all for nothing for hecuba what's hecuba to him or he to hecuba that he should weep for her what would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that i have he would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech make mad the guilty and appall the free confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears yet i a dull and muddy metalled rascal peak like john a dreams unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing no not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made am i a coward who calls me villain breaks my pate across plucks off my beard and blows it in my face 
tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! Huh. Swoons, I should take it. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful. Bloody, bawdy villain! Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain! Oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing, like a very drab, a scullion. Fie upon it, f about my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tend him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps, out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Exit. End of Act Two